Before we get going with today's episode, I wanted to let everybody know that we will be moving the first book club episode to the podcast, which releases on April 28th, 2021. That's episode 10. And our goal is going to be doing it every five episodes. So episode 10, episode 15, 20, you get the idea. So as a reminder, the first book we're doing is With by Sky Jatani. So grab yourself a copy, and now you have an extra couple weeks to get that read. We're going to have a guest on. We're really excited about that. So enjoy this episode, and see you guys later. And I have been searching For what most people say just can be found But you always find me out Welcome to Following the Fire. Thanks for joining us on this journey through the wilderness. Just like Israel followed the pillar of fire and smoke, we want to take a new look at our beliefs and just follow him. And like Israel, we get it wrong a lot, we get lost a lot, but we're we're doing our best to, to go where God leads us. I'm Nathan. And I'm Steve. Can't compare with what you're worth. Is restoring the first century church really what we should be focusing on? Um, Is there a danger in trying to do the right thing all the time? Is faith supposed to be scary? Should we all give Dancing Naked a try? These and other questions, if not answered, will at least be asked on this week's episode. All these messages I thought you wanted to hear but it only takes a whisper And I'll give you all my heart Well, how are you? How are you doing, Steve? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to... Well, first, first of all, question. Have you ever had a dog? Yes. Okay. So when you have a dog, you go to, to PetSmart or wherever they, to like do the training that you're supposed to do to teach them to sit and go down and roll over and that's about it. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, they tell you to leave it, right? Like teach the dog to leave it, like leave it, like treats on the ground, leave it, leave it. Okay. You can tell the dog they can have it. Yeah. I've been telling myself all day about arguing on the internet. Just leave it. (laughs) Just just leave it. Just leave it. You don't don't have to go get that. That's, you know, (laughs) That's a torn up piece of tissue. Just leave it. <laughs> yeah. I, but I can't. <laughs> Look okay, at I it. Up, I open up Facebook and I see the replies to my post or whatever. I'm like, leave it. Don't don't engage. <laughs> so. It's <laughs> it's impossible. Well, some people are better at posting a thing that just spirals. Yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, there then it's like the sunk cost, you know, psychological problem yeah. where well, now I'm 10 arguments into this comment. Right. I'm not stopping now. <laughs> I've got a lot invested, even though yeah. it's like, yeah, but you're not, you know, you're, you're not winning any of this back. Yeah. That's hard stuff. I I just use my, I get back in passive aggressive ways for the most part. So that's well, not, that's healthy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's it, 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 it's, it, you know, Things happen in the world, and you say a thing, and I'm I just I'm a I'm an eternal optimist, you know, despite the world. <laughs> uh, and I always think if I if I say this, then maybe this will help somebody, or and you know, it's like I and then I despair for humanity, <laughs> yeah, because of the responses that I get. So, and the, you I'm, know, I'm learning. <laughs> the problem is. 99% of humanity just isn't going to comment. Mm-hmm. And then the point point 0.5% is going to be like, we agree. And then the other point 0.5 is going to be like, you're the worst. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's hard. I, I can't imagine. I've been, I was looking at some books recently and I get a, a small guilty pleasure out of, reading amazon reviews and i skip to the one star reviews have i said this 
I don't. I don't think. Have I, don't I talked about this? Okay, it's a hobby of mine. <laughs> I think I have said this because one star reviews often say more about the reviewer than about the product. Oh, uh, this sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyways, the spin on it that I'm going to say today is I was imagining writing a book, and it would be impossible for me to not read all of the one star reviews. Oh, yeah. And and then just and s- uh, they're brutal. Yeah, you just like crawl in a corner and cry afterwards. Yeah, and you know the worst are there's all kinds of one star reviews, but there are like five paragraph one star reviews where I'm just gonna pull this person apart in who they are as a person, their style, their arguments, you know, and they they shouldn't have ever been born is the conclusion of the of the essay. <laughs> That's so much energy directed at a thing you don't like. Oh yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, and those people are on Facebook, and it would be so. I don't know what my response would be. I, I feel like it, it would be a. Uh, uh, similar to, the negative, or uh, argumentative posts on the Facebook comment. It's hard stuff. Leave it. Yeah, the block the block button is is a handy tool. Yeah. Should we? Should we jump into it? I've I've got a topic for today, and uh, I think I'm going to start it with, let's see. What is the statute of limitations for spoiler alerts for movies? Ooh, that's a hard one. Yeah. I, th- I think that I've ar- I already specifically said movies, because if it's like Hamilton and it's a play, then that's different, but... And now in COVID world, I I don't know the rules anymore because there's no such thing as there's not the theater period and then the release period. It's all this. It's all melted together a little bit. Yeah, there's there's got to be some like three D graph that you can map about, <laughs> like how popular is the movie, how big is the spoiler, how long, how like you know, like I I wouldn't want to spoil the big Darth Vader reveal sure. to a little kid who's never seen Star Wars, for example. Yeah, there's the size of the reveal, six cents, Darth yep, Vader. Yep. Um any any huge twist. Um so anyway, that's my way of saying I'm gonna talk about I'm not gonna give you a spoiler alert, and I'm gonna talk about a movie that came out in nineteen eighty seven. Oh, I think it's pretty all right. Yeah, I think we're fine. But yeah. it's a classic though, so that that's the Princess Bride. Oh th- yeah. Which I consider canon. Um, if, you, if, you, if you haven't watched Princess Bride by now, then you don't deserve to listen to this podcast anyway. Right. It's, and <laughs> based on based on how similar we are, I, I would say that a hundred percent of our listeners have seen. Princess Bride. Oh yeah, yeah, guaranteed. They're, if they haven't, their life is on the wrong trajectory, and there's no hope for them anyway. So, <laughs> um, so many deep and scriptural and theological. Uh, ramifications of that movie but one that I haven't heard from the pulpit lately is a little throwaway line there's this group of bandits there's Vicini Mm -hmm. who is the mastermind and the boss Uh, he's the brains and Vicini has hired a giant to be his brute force muscle guy and a Spaniard who is great with a sword for his you know sword skills so they together they're the the criminal perfect team uh and uh at some point early in the movie vicini insults both of them talking about how much they need him and he to the giant he says something like do you want me to send you back to where you were unemployed in greenland (laughs) uh and to the spaniard when i found you you were so slobbering drunk you couldn't buy brandy (laughs) <laughs> so uh so we hear this little line about the Spaniard. Then things go wrong. Vicini dies. Iocane poisoning. Iocane poisoning. Because of his pride. And then we, we catch up, uh we find ourselves in the the thieves forest. Yeah. And there's a a slobbering drunk Inigo Montoya, the Spaniard. So we come on to him, and he's yelling to nobody, holding his sword out. I am waiting for you, Vicini. 
You told me to go back to the beginning. So I have. This is where I am, and this is where I'll stay. I will not be moved. And then later he says, When the job went wrong, you went back to the beginning. Well, this is where we got the job. So it's the beginning. And I am staying till Vicini come. This is the beginning. Yeah. Um, and the that that stuck out to me. I watched that movie recently. And the uh the f- I'm very good at taking things that are funny and then drying them out bone crisp dry. This is a comedy <laughs> movie. But to dissect what's going on, uh in Inigo the plan B was if things go wrong, start from the top. Yep. And so he thinks, okay, wait a minute. So when when did things go right to me? That's when Vicini hired me. That that's when I I was doing well. What was I doing when Vicini hired me? I was really drunk in the thieves forest. So when things go wrong, the the comical thing that he decides is, oh, of course, what I need to go do is go get drunk again and wait in the thieves forest because good things are going to happen to me again. Yeah. And the what I'm going to call the uh, Inigo is the foolish restorationist. Hmm. So I I kind of want to talk a little bit about we're part I don't know 50 to 80% of this podcast is about questioning things. Yeah. Um and I'm not questioning questioning. <laughs> I I am a I am all the way in the camp of it is valuable to reexamine things. Yeah. And in fact, I think we need to do more and more to expand the boundaries of what we should question or re-examine and that the broader that is uh it's, it's not it's scary at first but it, i think there's value in that 100 percent. but i i do want to challenge an assumption that under underlies the problem with assumptions is you you skip you skip the thinking step it's where you start from yeah and so there's there's an assumption that um especially since both of us are uh our christian experiences in the restoration movement mhm there's an assumption that going back to the basics is an inherently good thing yes and the more i've i've looked at maybe my own life or or other christians or or ways churches are kind of getting off track or not the more i've started to wonder is it true is it hmm. true that that back to basics is an inherently good thing and an ego shows us that it's possible to get it wrong right and so the the kind of one question i it's a rhetorical question but i, I think how christians answer it is will will fuel how they think about the church and how they think about the Bible. So okay. uh, if we looked at a timeline starting in 30 AD to 33 AD <laughs> and then going to the end of time and you had to put a pin somewhere, which is where Christians got it the most right, where would you put the pin? Uh <clears throat> Uh, well, I know, I, I know where I may have put it before you, before your preamble. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I, I kind of, I have, I've poisoned the. No, but it, uh, it's honestly a really good question because I mean, there's lots of ways to answer that. I guess it could be, you know, like the, the first Christians got it right because they were closest to Jesus, and then right, you could say that maybe everybody's got it right on some level because things change and. Um, I don't know. It's hard. It, it's a hard one because like, like I mentioned like last time, like it, the Bible wasn't really pulled together until, you know, a couple hundred years later. Um, so if it's right, you know, th- th- I don't know. Lo- lots of, I, my mind's going in thousands of different directions right now. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's, there's not a correct answer and it, it, but I think it's an interesting thing to th- think about. Um, my opinion, which is 
my opinions are not verified correct. So just my opinion of the day is that I grew up believing that the best Christians were the first Christians. Hmm. But what I, if I were to place my pin now, I would say the best Christians were the last Christians. And I would use last as in the most recent and also, you know, the, the church getting it the most right. If I was putting my pin in from Jesus to the end of time, I'd put it at the end of time because I believe that there's a, a, a direction of, Hmm. of a church that is approaching something. And it's, it's almost a question you can answer as far as definitely hasn't been linear by the way. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say the middle ages were better than the 200s or that today is better, going to be better than tomorrow, but you can almost even answer it on an individual level. So like what Christians are the best Christians are, is it a new Christian or a mature Christian? And it's kind of like, well, it's different. Um, who's going to do it the most right is probably, well, yeah, I know that even that is impossible to answer, but the a mature Christian who is, has experience, maybe who's going to be the most passionate, but get a lot of things wrong would be the, a new Christian, a, mm-hmm. you know, a, an individual who's, who's new. And I, so I would argue that the last Christians are the ones who ha- have it the most right. And the first Christians, I think that the, there are examples from the Bible that show us that, that the first Christians were, got it horribly wrong. They, they like Peter, one of the first Christians was all kinds of misdirected and misguided. Mm-hmm. The, if you, if you kind of read through the lines in epistles from Paul, you see some pretty messed up stuff going on in churches. Oh yeah. We, and not in ways that we would want to emulate. We we would want to follow Paul's advice to those churches, but not, but we would not want to be like those churches. Yep. And revelation, you could even maybe read some of that in. And it's all a paradigm thing. It's an assumption thing. So if you believe that sometimes it is good to go back to the pure un uh what un unadulterated unadulterated <laughs> yeah undefiled form of something like if you want to know the historical facts of an event you should get sources that were early that were close and and that's a good practice so it's it's kind of like the difference between i don't know uh, like a historical event, you want to get primary documents. Right. And a primary document means it's that's close to the source. You don't want the secondary that was reading the primary or the tertiary, et cetera. Yeah. But if you're designing a wheel, you you're not you're not gonna say like, well, what was the first wheel like? Let's yeah. do that. Because that they had it the most perfect. So so I think just asking the question is valuable, especially to us. Uh, products of the restoration movement um, is is the first century Christian the the Christian that we want to emulate. Um, and if I can interrupt you for a second on that point, um, the the question you asked is which where would you put the pin and where they got it the most right? Yeah, that in in a way that kind of assumes that doing church right is the goal and which is something I'm kind of rethinking, you know? Right. Right. And, but I, I liked what you just said as far as like, who, which one, which of the Christians we want to emulate. And if I, if I may hazard a sports ball analogy. Nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, if I asked you who was, what, who was the best football team ever? Barcelona, maybe. Uh, <laughs> just... Like American football. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I mean that 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 you'd have to go. You have to ask all kinds of questions. Like, well, if it was like back in the the thirties or the forties, I and mean, they're good for different reasons. Is, is is it the team that won the most? Is it the team that um, overcame the biggest hurdles? You know, there, there's all these kinds of things. It's not you can't really say that football has gotten better. 
over time right. or baseball yeah. or whatever. It's not that, that it's improving. It's that there are times in that, that, that it just changes. It's always, it's different all the time. Yeah. And it, it, it's an impossible question to answer too. It's like saying, is Usain Bolt a better runner than, uh, another know. runner? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, who, who is, who is the runner at the, at the Hitler games that raised his fist? Oh, uh, Jackie Robinson. There you go. No. No? Is that him? I'm going to look it up because... No, the, he was... Jackie Robinson's a baseball player. Yeah. Um, I, I can't believe I don't know this. Oh, it's like on the tip of my tongue, though, like Owen. Well, hold on. Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens. Yep. Okay, so, by the way, I, I realized the other day... we. In our introduction, I say we get it wrong a lot of the time, which means we never have to go back and do corrections because I already told you. (laughs) (laughs) I was listening to the one where I was trying to remember the story of Judah and Tamar, but I said, I was like, it's either Isaac or Jacob. One of of those two. As I was listening to it, I was like, it's Judah, you idiot. (laughs) um, But the disclaimer is in the intro, so. Anyways, um, yeah, it's it's unfair to say Usain Bolt is a better runner. He he's been building on, he's he's running on a different track with better shoes, with better yep. training, with better food, and he's getting paid to do it. You know? Yeah. Um. So it, it's and the question who got it the most right is exactly like you said, the complete wrong question to be asking. Anyways, it it assumes there's a there's a blueprint standard that is if all, if a hundred percent, it's a test. If a hundred percent of the boxes were checked, you get a hundred percent. If 80% of the boxes are checked, you get a 80, percent but I, you know. And it also assumes that there was a point in time that things were finished. Like, yes, at this point, everything's done. All the, all the edges are nice and clean we have all the answers to all the stuff we have or that we need to have answers for and then from here on out it's just all like trying to meet that standard yeah just keep it keep it going I, there's a there's a parable i made up that i was trying to capture this idea of so a man buys a plot of land on a hilltop in a small town and he goes about trying to build his house. And after a year, his he's finished the house, he moves in. But he starts to realize the switches are in the wrong place, the windows are too small. Hmm. And so he bulldozes the house and reformulates his plan and builds it again, switches in the right place, windows in the right place. But then he realizes the door is the wrong color, the carpet is too long. And so every year, he at, right as he moves into the house, he bulldozes it, rewrites his plans, and then and then the kicker would be if he dies and we find out he's using like mansion on a hilltop and he thinks that's instructions for a perfect house or something. <laughs> but the but his his error, his logical error is he thinks that the perfect house is when you have all of the th- right things. Hmm. And in the pursuit of having all the correct components he has bulldozed over his life 10 homes that and he he's realized a perfect home is not a home that has these thing these things these components a perfect home is a thing that does this for you it provides shelter it's comfortable it ha- it has room to keep you safe and keep your belongings in it and if if you're if you believe that the perfect home the perfect house is a list of things instead of thinking about what should a house do yeah, is it fulfilling its purpose is it fulfilling its purpose and 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 when you go to the bible or mm-hmm. you go to jesus if you think that we have a blueprint and that our job is to follow the blueprint you're like the man who is trying to build the perfect house by having all the right components. Hmm. 
That that's an interesting thought. I don't believe that Jesus or the Bible is the blueprint for how to do Christianity right. I believe Jesus is the seed. The the movement the New Testament or the the Bible is the seed that is planted and that the church is a thing that is growing from that seed with Jesus as a root in a in a continuous uh upbuilding upgrowing fashion. Yeah. It kind of has to do with, I think if you look at church language or language about the, the growth of the church in, in the New Testament, yeah. you see some continuous growth language as, as the body comes together and is built up. And there's definitely root language, uh, yeah. root and vine language. And so what if as restorationists, we're knocking down a 2,000-year-old house on a hill that has value to it and that is is fulfilling a purpose and we're looking we're looking at a book the bible for the blueprint for how to do it right when the bible never purports to be that for us it, it it's, it's not a claim the bible makes about itself that it's the here is the way to to do this right but we just want it we want it to be that really bad up in the restoration movement world um actually on our church here in town there's a plaque on the wall on the outside this church established in 1930 in, in sorry this church established in 33 ad nice yeah. and um and this building was built in like 1968 or whatever it was <laughs> right uh, yeah and so um we it, we had this idea that we want to be the church that the the assumption, like you said, that the the uh, early church got it all right, and we want to be like the early church because because they they checked the boxes and they did the right things. And thinking about your the 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 way you rephrased the question a minute ago, as far as which who we want to emulate, like you know, if I go back in in the, on the timeline, the, the one I want to emulate is Christ. <laughs> Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> and it it's like we get kind of I feel like we get hung up on emulating people like the Corinthians and and the Laodiceans and and these people 2000 years ago that we don't know any, anything about and we're we're stuck on emulating that and not emulating Christ. Yeah, the, maybe I'm jumping ahead, I don't know. No, you you're you're exactly right. The I have said before if if you if you think the Bible is a order of worship document, yeah, then you'll you'll look verse by verse and and you'll try to find that, but it just isn't that. But it definitely tells us who Christ was, yeah, um, and what he is looking for in his church. But most of that does not have to do with a Sunday morning, what happens on a Sunday morning, and who does those things on a Sunday morning. Most of that has to do with how you treat your money, how you treat your neighbor and your enemy, your relationship between yourself and God, and how that plays out with your relationship with other people. There's a lot of that. Yeah. Jesus does not give us how to do it right if it is what church congregation is singing the right way or is you know, hiring the right people or the wrong people or meeting on the wrong or right day. None of that's in there. And the, but so that there's a whole societal blindness and as restoration people, we, we have a deep one, but you, do you have any, you you have a lot of books. Do you have any, um, non-religious books? So not at all uh, to do with, any kind of faith stuff, okay. but that are either called something Bible or are nicknamed something Bible. Oh, I'm sure. I think, yeah, I think, so. yeah, I think you... I've got like the UX Bible. The UX Bible. Or, yep. Uh, yeah. No, 
I I I see those all the time. Yeah, I've I I went through. I've got the Beekeepers Bible, the Mountaineering <laughs> Bible, the Home Brewing Bible. I've got the Engineers Bible, um, and then I've got a Wastewater Bible. It's a lot of Bibles, and man. It's a it's a lot of, it's a lot of Bibles, and they're all exactly the same. You, they are referen- They're thick. They're comprehensive reference mm-hmm. books that have an index and uh, what's the, what's the word for the index? But at the end, with all the words, uh, concordance or something. I thought that's the index. Con- Contents at the beginning and index at the back. Thank you. So, thick book. It's a reference book. It's comprehensive about the subject, and it tells you how to do it right. Right. And the way you use it, by the way, it, it'd be kind of foolish to read it from start to finish unless you're maybe new. The way you use it is you you go to it with a question. So my beekeeper's Bible, my bees are twirling in loops. And you open, <laughs> you open it up to the table of contents and look, okay, common bee diseases. And you flip through that. And then you find swirling bee disease. And here's what, <laughs> here's what you do for it. Right. And so our word, our word for that, what is the thing that tells you how to do it? The comprehensive instruction manual is Bible. Bible. But the Bible is, this is a sentence to unpack. The Christian Bible is not the Christian's Bible. <laughs> Meaning, if you've got the beekeeper's Bible, the Christian's Bible is not the Bible because it doesn't exist. We don't have the comprehensive with an index and a concordance. What's the answer to my Christian life question that I just had? Yeah. The Bible is not trying to do that, but even our word in our society for what is a thing that tells you how to do everything right about some topic yeah, is Bible. And it's so if, the authority on right and wrong on things. The Yes, yes. And I'll try to unpack this and see if I agree with myself, but Scripture is useful, but... I don't believe the Bible gives us everything that we need to follow Christ. And the, the thing that a restoration movement person has maybe lost sight of is that we were given the word. It's useful. It's And it's a very good thing. But it doesn't tell you how to Christian. It tells you who you are. It tells you who Christ is. But it doesn't say, how do you do Sunday right? Or how often do you Sunday? Mm-hmm. Or or what's Wednesday night all about? Certainly doesn't tell you are the Baptists more right than the Methodists in their Sunday morning practices. But the the church is a thing that Christ established and is led by the Spirit. But as Restoration people, we have placed so much faith in the Word alone, but not a whole lot of faith in what is happening in the, in the church. Uh, so much so that we... C- we would never delete the whole Bible and say, well, let's start over. Yeah. Right. But, but we are a little bit more okay with looking to the Bible to do our full foundation. But I'm proof that you can, you can read the whole Bible and get it completely wrong because you also need to have a relationship with Christ. And you also need your relationship with other people impacts how you're going to do that. And, and the, um, the we're given this word, but we're given the body of Christ as well and the spirit of Christ. And I think that they are not to be discounted so easily. And so when we're looking at uh can't you know translations or you know the the Bible okay, I, I guess another way to say it is the Bible doesn't have all the answers to what is the absolute universal right thing in this moment or in this worship service or to this political thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, if you, if you want to go to the New Testament and, and try to find as many laws and rules and do this, don't do that, there there's some of that in there. Um, but if you, if, I feel like we, we need to try to, have changed the paradigm a little bit of how we 
approach scripture as far as not a rule book that we just try to follow the rules and check the boxes, but something that teaches us how to be like Christ. Right. And and the the way that it teaches us to be like Christ is are things like who does Christ see? Who does Christ value? How, you know, how does Christ approach people? Yeah. Um, so so th- those are priorities. Those are alignment of of character and relationship and priorities. But what what humans historically have wanted to get out of Scripture since Jesus' time, before his time, and after his time is, well, just what is the... Who's right and who's wrong? Yeah. On this on this issue, um, and I, so I, you know, I would posit that the first Christians were the worst Christians because they they were clumsily following Christ with all of their hearts. So, so I'm being a little bit facetious because that's that's also the best kind of Christian. Yeah, yeah. But if we're looking for what does a Sunday look like, the, it, you know, it's the probably the wrong group to emulate but the i think we want to have the answer to who's who's right on the gun control issue that just came up yeah and the bible says that i'm right well the i I think the list of absolute universal truths in the bible is a really short list Mm. it's it's not meaning to be the once and for all settling the dispute like my wastewater operators Bible can be, or my home brewing Bible can be. How do you convert this to this? You know, what is an IPA? Yeah. The Bible's really good at if, if your question is who were Noah's sons, or if you if you want to go on a journey and figure out what was Israel's relationship with God like. Yeah. Lots of information. Yeah, and it and it's it, it is orienting. It's supposed to be yeah. orienting us towards God and helping us to understand ourselves. But it just isn't, it doesn't provide this, well, what is, who is right in this scenario? Even Jesus frequently would not even answer that. When when people said, here's an issue of the day, who's right and who's wrong? Even Jesus isn't, Jesus isn't trying to answer that for people. He was trying to have people take a step back and not think about the checkbox, check box issue who's right and who's wrong or what's the right thing to do or the right way to vote or how much money i should give it was it was deeper than that yeah even when i was thinking back to when jesus was tempted by satan um this is a a a story that's brought up often when this kind of topic comes up in church that you like the to be ready to answer anything and you know to defend your faith and all that kind of thing Um, When Jesus was being tempted by Satan, the responses he gave to Satan's temptations were not necessarily like, they weren't like, oh, the Bible says do this and don't do that. He was answering like higher level things. (laughs) He's like, yes, this is how you should be. You know, it's, it's taught to us as though Jesus is using the Bible as a rule book. And you should do the same thing because Jesus did it. But if you look at what he's saying, that's not the that's not the approach that Jesus is taking at all. Right. It's not Satan, you got this wrong on a technicality, and I'm gonna show you the Bible verse that proves it. Um it's Yeah, yeah it's like we tell these sons to become bread, and Jesus doesn't say, I shouldn't t- I shouldn't do that because then I would be bowing to your power and there here's a scripture that says no. He says Man shouldn't live on bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right. It's like, okay, well, hold on. (laughs) That that's a (laughs) that's a different question answer than I than I asked. That was not the question that I asked. Yeah i I think I think there's a a zoom level too, or a granularity for how useful is a Bible verse to my argument. So the example we were given, Jesus gives a, snor- a short snippet, and and I think, I don't think that's our only example of or why we tend to like to focus on short sections. But most of my life, a Bible study or a devo or a sermon 
is zoomed into a pretty short passage of the Bible. Yeah. Sometimes it's just one verse. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes maybe there'd be an overview of an entire book, but usually it's maybe a little section, three or four paragraphs. And you can you can base an entire belief system on a really short verse in the Bible, especially if you are expecting it to have that kind of answer. The Everything in the Bible is true independent of the other parts, and each little verse is going to have the application to my life. But I think that comes from reading into the Bible with, with this desire to get it right. But when you're trying to follow and understand who Christ was or what what's going on here, you have to take a few steps further back than that. You, you can't just... It, it's fine to, to meditate on a verse, but it's important to balance that with taking steps back to see what's the whole book saying or what's the what's the whole what is the context of the book within the story yeah we're really good at proof to the term is proof texts proof texting if you want to turn yeah. it into a verb we're we're good at finding a a verse that says the thing that we want to hear or the thing that we want to know about um and you know they're they're famously unreliable because as you said it's 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 ignoring the context of things um and it's ignoring all kinds of stuff and if you if you focus on just looking for the answer for musical instruments for example you look at that one one verse in Ephesians or whatever it is and mm. then you you're done and you move on and look for the answer to something else right but like it's like it's like real estate, you know, location, location, location. <laughs> this is context, 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 yeah. and and I think that the that so much of scripture is is it's telling a story. It's telling all about, like you said, it's telling us who we are. Uh, it's telling us who God is, and um, yet there are. I I think there are definitely some rules. There are some guidance. Uh, I, I'm not. I don't. I wouldn't want to say that it's completely not that way at all, but. Um, yeah, and I, I have some thoughts about why the restoration movement is so stuck on getting it right. I want, I want to know. Okay. Looking back at the restoration movement, Tom uh, with Thomas Campbell and is it Alexander Campbell, anyway Stone and Campbell, Stone and Campbell, Alex the Stone and Campbell movement, Barton W. Stone and Alexander Campbell. Anyway, looking back at that movement, the um, Campbell had a, a a newsletter called the Millennial Harbinger, and that's a cool name. Yeah, the millennial harbinger, really cool name. Um, yeah, but what it what what it was, the what that term meant was that it was a the harbinger of the millennium, meaning the the millennium being the thousand year reign of Christ on Earth. Which meant he was like announcing it before it came, and yeah. so in his, um, his theology of the end times. Um, he believed that if we could get enough Christians on earth doing the right thing, then Jesus would come back and we'd all go to heaven. He would reign on earth for a thousand years uh, and we'd all go to heaven. It makes me sad because I've believed that in my personal life, that if I'm just good enough, that then I'm going to be acceptable to God. Yeah. And th that's the collective version of that, that if we all squeeze our Christian muscles tight enough. Yes. Then um, God's finally going to be like, all right, I, you know, finally you read it right. You, well, yeah. And the rightness was kind of twofold. It was, it was on one hand, it was 
getting like a critical mass of percentage of the world being a Christian. And the other, ha- the other part of it was those Christians who are in that critical mass have to be doing it the right way. And so yeah. that led to that, that kind of mentality that theology led to a lot of hyper focus on church worship stuff, um, church uh, structure, leadership structure. Do I like what, what version of the Bible do I use? Um, do I meet on Sunday or Saturday? Um, do I uh, on and on and on and on? Yeah. Because it was just, it was this obsession with doing it the right way. So you could trigger Jesus to come back. Like, like he's waiting up there, you know, like, Oh, almost guys. Yeah, like the, the, yeah. the scales tipping, you know, you can do it. But I think that a lot of people who don't, in the restoration movement don't realize that that's, that's where this comes from. That's where the the core of this is. It's, it's not that Paul said, you guys have to do every single thing right. Or, you know, you're going straight to hell. He says a lot about like, follow me as I follow Christ, you know, I'm trying to be like Christ. You do that too. Yeah. But we, we have taken it and we've made it this thing that is, if we don't do this stuff, we don't go to heaven and Jesus doesn't come to earth. And that that's a, like the, the end times theology that we have now in, in most of the churches in the restoration movement is completely different from that. We, we would like these, we would make, we make fun of like people who get into like uh, the left behind series and the rapture and stuff like that. But it was the same kind of thing. And so I, it, I think if we can seeing that, I think will help. But I think we need to pull back from that. And that's a scary proposition for a lot of people because suddenly you are unmoored and you have no nothing to hold on to. Or you feel like you have nothing to hold on to because we've trained ourselves for so many decades to hold on to, to the rules and the right and the wrong. And we're obsessed with that. And I, I, and I wish that we would just try to not be so focused on so the I there's a quote that I, I loved. Um I was listening to a podcast by Brene Brown and uh, her Daring to Lead podcast and she and she's probably said this elsewhere, but she said, I'm not here to, to be right, I'm here to get it right. That doesn't mean that so she, in, in the context she was saying is she's she's like, I'm not here to tell you what's right and to be correct all the time. I'm here to get it right, meaning I'm here to learn. I'm here to grow. I'm here to process what's going on and try to go in the right direction, not be right. Because when you when you say I'm, I am right, it's it's a final it's a final thing. You're done. I'm I'm complete. And I think that to your point of all this growth uh, phraseology and ter- and uh, metaphor in in New Testament. That we need to, we need to be always growing. Yeah, and I, th- I think we're, I think that there is some. I don't believe Christians are meant to do this alone. I, I think that the church is one of the tools that God uses to do His work, and um, I think, I think what you mentioned is really, really powerful. So I want to reiterate it that when you've gone from knowing that your specific church has it right, that's a very comforting feeling. Yeah. And, and you, you don't even have to know why you have it right or what you have right. That's, that's just, it doesn't matter. Just, just having the feeling that, Oh, I'm in the right place and we've got it right is where a lot of people are. They, they didn't read, you know, they don't know that it's because of stone and Campbell and, and this movement and that movement and that it came to, to be in this way, they just know, hey, the preacher says we're right. And that feels really good um, until something changes or you encounter something else. And then it feels extremely threatening. Yeah. Because you, you had your faith in your self-righteousness as a body 
not as an individual, but as a, as a body, you had your faith in that you did the right work to, to figure it all out, but you don't have your, but your, so your faith is misguided, which is why it's scary when, when you encounter a, a follower who is following in the footsteps of Christ and is a Catholic or is, or does something completely different or, or disagrees on an issue that to you feels like a fundamental issue. And so then the reaction to that is that you want to retreat to your position. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, defend it more and, and cement it in because that was the safe feeling that you had. But my, my call to those people is it, it, that, that is a scary feeling, but it's, you're moving to a, to a freedom and to a joy and a growth that is, uh, unlimited. It's, it's like bowling with, if you bowled with bumpers all your life, (laughs) being scared of taking the bumpers off, but you're, but that's the step towards maturity, but it's also, I think the hard thing, but the, I don't know, the, the fun thing about Christ is that the, you can take the, the training wheels of legalism off of being right about everything. Um, and if, if you're following Christ, you're, you didn't need them anyways. You don't, you don't need the training wheels. If you are loving people like Christ loves people, you, that, that's why Jesus says, talks about the, the first commandment, the, yeah. the most important. Mm-hmm. It's because he knows that the, just love it's, it's, it's like, well, but that doesn't tell me how to do everything right, right. Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, what everyone that came to Jesus wanted clarification on, yeah, I know you're, you keep saying that Jesus, yeah. but, but what about, but what about this or, but who should I love and how much and for how right. long? 77 times, yeah. you know, is this my neighbor is, do I really have to do this? That they're all trying to box him back in. And he he keeps frustrating them because he he's not answering them in their paradigm of um you can't get an A plus in Christianity because there's not a rubric that you're being graded against where where you can get a two percent higher score than the next person. I mean that's where grace comes into this and I think that's the whole point of grace. Well, there's grace, but I think we, especially from our restoration background, we think of grace as making up the difference between I got an 87% on the test and I need a 90 to pass. So the grace covers the 3%. But the grace covers the 100% and the the righteousness is was never designed to be from us at all. It, it wasn't supposed to be us squeezing our Christian muscles extra hard. It's literally, and Paul is saying this and screaming this, that you're supposed to let him be the righteousness for you. And it, and so the setting yourself up, up with that relationship will, as an accidental byproduct, give you the righteousness, which is a too bible of a word for us to be using now. But, um, but what we want to do is, no, but how can I do it myself? That, that's what these rules are. It's yeah, yeah. That's fine, Jesus. I I'd rather do it myself if you could just tell me the, give me a better Bible that actually has the how to do it all right. You know, I'm 34 and I'm in the U.S. and I make this much money, so I'll flip to that section of the Bible <laughs> and it'll just say, here's what you do. That I, yes, something. So you know the the phrase I hear often is. I just want to make God happy or something along those lines. Like I want to, I want to be pleasing to God, um, make Jesus happy or ha- uh, proud of me, that kind of thing. And I just realized when you were talking how I think completely off base that is. <laughs> yeah. Are you a strict, you know, stay, stay a tiger mom? Are, are you a, are you, are your kids never good enough for you unless they're performing to the highest level? Or are when when your kids make you happy, is it when they rely on you, when they're communicating with you, when they are 
uh, showing others kindness on the playground? You know? Well, by saying, you know, it's like, okay, here I am, saved Christian. Um, I have, you know, I have become part of the body of Christ, a spirit in me, and my sins are cleansed. I have none of that's in none of that's a problem right now. So I theoretically have a connection with God and I have, and he, like he sees me through Christ, right? So he sees purity. So why am I trying to please him? Why am I trying to make him happy? Like, like if I don't, it's like, yeah, sure. Fine. You're forgiven, whatever. <laughs> But now you gotta like try really hard, even though that that's not gonna make you more saved. You gotta try extra hard to make him happy, whatever that means. And I, I guess I, I'm just kind of thinking about how that doesn't really track. I mean, there's nothing wrong with trying to do that, but this feeling that we we have to, I don't know. There can be something wrong with it. So that it's we're not, you know, I'm not saying Paul addresses this. It's not the point is not to now that you're free to just be as bad as you want because then God's <laughs> grace is bigger, right? Right, right. But that's not a danger for people in relationship with Christ anyways. It's not that slippery slope is a hundred miles away from where you are if you're trying to follow Christ. Yeah, because I I think that that's kind of Paul's point. If you're if you're doing that then you're not following Christ. It's, right. It's kind yeah. of, and the, it's kind and of a tip off. And that's an example of how the first Christians got it way wrong because they were like, they were they did the spiritual math because they had a couple of people who are too logical like me. And they were like, wait a minute. If I, if I sin 10 times, God's going to forgive that. And that's grace. If I sin 50 times, that's five times more grace. And grace is how God is glorified, right? So somebody in the yeah. early church did that you know, a little bit too logical math, right? <laughs> and Paul was like, oh no, you know, they're those early Christians, man, Miss, I hope people don't try to emulate them. And then he... Missing the point, he, right? He, yeah, missing the point. But then he he nudged him back to, okay, that's that's a little bit missing the point. But the, but the, the relationship and the following is the point. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say, that there can be a problem if you're doing these things to make God happy because you think that it, me being good enough is, is what restores my relationship to God. Yeah. That's what I mean. And there, there's fear behind that, that if I'm not good enough, that, that it's not going to be, but I'm pretty sure that we can be the types of Christians like Paul sorry, or Peter more, more like Peter that are, or like David, um, he's not a Christian, but the kinds of followers <laughs> that are jumping in with their hearts, trying to get the heart stuff right, and they're a little bit less concerned about the periphery stuff because David got it weirdly wrong. Um, Peter, you know, got it wrong his whole life, um, including after Christ when he was an apostle and he was leading churches. He was still getting it wrong, but he was. It wasn't about how how good he was and nobody writes to us that Paul after meeting Jesus was the most right, righteous in the land. That, that's not the moral of the story that there are people who are changed that, that they encounter Christ and then it changes them. But it's, you know, like Zacchaeus is a good example. Uh, Zacchaeus encounters Christ and his natural reaction to it is justice for people. It's social justice for the oppressed that he has been oppressing. Yeah. It, w it wasn't Jesus saying you should only charge 2% more than the Romans because that's how much you live. It was, it was him having a relationship with Jesus. And then he's, he can see what he can see what that means and, and do that. And, um, so I, I think as I think taking the first steps towards that freedom is really scary and that's why it's important not to bulldoze the entire house. But instead, we can look around at however 
much I want to stretch this analogy that the house is on a thousand hills or the or the or the one big house that's being built together slowly and we can see other Christians who have who are doing this right now uh, Christians who around us locally or even it, you know we can look at Christians from a thousand years ago a hundred years ago 50 years ago and five minutes ago and see how those people are living out those expressions of what what does it look like to follow Christ and we can dive into the word we can dive into the scripture and see what does it look like to follow Christ back to what you just said as, as far as David and Peter you know David he, he he we always talk about how he's referred to as the man after God's own heart but he screwed up a lot yeah. um, and I, I think of him this this came up recently I was talking to my kids about this about how he was dancing naked before the Lord basically dancing in his underwear and, yep. and they had like symbols and the like the trumpets are you know loud raucous music and he's dancing before God and I, I I think about that phrase a man after God's own heart and how I I see David as somebody who was more concerned with that relationship connection with God than he was with should I be dancing in my underwear yeah in the, in the what temple? should my state of undress be when right. I'm worshiping God? Right. He was just so full of love and joy and and whatever that he just that he felt like that's what he needed to do right now for God. And those are those are the that is the most unlike me. Yeah. And that is what I admire so much when I see it in other Christians that are just out there with their expressions of joy with their gratitude to God when I wouldn't have even thought about it with their love or concern for other people they're just they're following all the way and the and they're they're not trying to make sure they're inside the bounds so much as they're just trying to make sure they're still moving am I am I still you know and and I want to have everything figured out before I take a single step on a journey oh yeah but that means I don't go very far. <laughs> yeah, I I was thinking as with about the idea of comfort, as you mentioned, and how having answers and having a specific solution or, or direction to go, the more specific, the better. It brings you more comfort, and I you know with all this QAnon stuff that's been going on uh over the past year four years whatever um i've i've been doing a lot of uh reading and research as far as like conspiracy theory stuff and one of the gr- huge draws to conspiracy theories is that they give you a simple answer to a complex problem and it feels mm-hmm. good because um understanding how the politics of the United States works in, in all the, I mean, it's, it's ridiculously complex. There's all these different movers and forces and all these things. But if I can just say, well, there's a, there's a uh, deep state that's controlling stuff. Oh, that, you know, it may, we, we sometimes joke about how conspiracy theories are complex and convoluted, but they're really basic and simple. Right. You know, how should I feel about the Democrats? Oh, they're all baby eaters and, and pedophiles. <laughs> oh, well, right. then, that, then I can... Oh, good. Yeah. Th- Not a whole lot of nuance. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, therefore, I can stick them all in the, in the, uh, in the bad guy category, and yeah. I can move on with my life. 
And it's a, it's the same idea with with the, for lack of a, of better terms, liberal and conservative Christian uh, approaches to things. Uh, the people who tend to be more conservative are less comfortable with new, complex ideas that they hadn't heard of before. People who are on the other side of things tend to kind of get a dopamine a dopamine hit by learning a new thing or <laughs> like i i totally get a dopamine hit when i when i like i i completely thought that that was different in my whole life you know if i yeah it, it's like the twist at the end of a movie that's that's great um and and every time that happens to me i it's like that that jazzes me up i love finding out that i'm wrong and right interesting and because it, when I find out that I'm wrong, I have grown. I have learned something. If right. I, if I go all my whole life and never I'm never wrong, I haven't learned a thing. I'm not growing. I'm not changing. I'm not becoming a better person. And I guess you could go on extremes on both directions with that. But I think what a lot of the restoration movement it 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 um it fosters and it rewards the idea of nothing should change. Everything's figured out. We have all the answers for you. Now just keep doing the same thing over and over. And then that, that'll, that'll make sure that you get to heaven. And I think that that, that leaves out so much that leaves out the opportunity to dance naked before God. I know. Yeah. There. And <laughs> That's that's funny. I do that all the time. <laughs> dance naked before I, God? Yeah, just kidding. I <laughs> I don't dance. I I don't like I don't get naked. Uh um I'm very much not like David. I I wonder what char- character in the Bible I'm the most like. I have to think I have to think of, think about that. I I think you got it right. Hit the nail right on the head with that. And it's not that it's if you're a person that tends to be uh, on that conservative side that is uncomfortable with new ideas or, you know, it's not that being comfortable with new ideas is better than being uncomfortable with it. Mm -hmm. I think it's what's important is to know when it comes to that, what are you? Uh, Like, how do you, how do you interpret new ideas? It's good to know if you're someone that's like, I'm just going to follow it all the way off a cliff. Or if it's, uh, it's, the new idea scares me. I think that's the a level of awareness enough that we need in in churches for people to know. Like, oh, I I tend to be something someone who, um, you know, gets a little bit, uh, my adrenaline spikes a little bit when when it we're changing something. Then you know that about yourself, and you can f- see it happening, which kind of takes some of that power away from it. But I think there's a more than fear. Uh, th- this comes up in with uh, in the book with, and we'll probably talk about it. But there's also something that what satiates fear for us is control. Mm. But more than control is just the illusion of control. So yeah. I I don't know if you've ever heard a creak in the night. Mm-hmm. It's the middle of the night, and you're you're not sure if there's a person in your house or not. Do you do you have anything that you do? <laughs> I don't know. I'd probably just lay there and hope it didn't happen again. <laughs> yeah, <I'd> fr- <laughs> <It's> freeze. <laughs> well, so the, there's the play dead freeze, so that it does the scary thing doesn't see you there. Maybe um, get a baseball bat and like slowly walk down the stairs. <laughs> yeah, I might. I'll go and like nervously look around the house and then lock the door. Mm-hmm. Um, you might turn a light on. You might you might grab your baseball bat or some semblance of like now I'll fight off whatever that was yeah. right. All of those things are us having a fear and then just wanting to feel a little bit in control. And it doesn't matter that none of those things are protecting us from the fact that our house is creaky. Yeah. We feel better, not because of the control, but because of the semblance of control. Because we're doing something. That I did something. And when it comes to religion, ancient religion was all about that. Uh, I can't, I don't know how people get pregnant. I don't know how crops work. Um, but I want, and it sometimes there's hurricanes, and I'm an ancient person, just with no feeling of control. 
Yeah. And so what you do is, uh, I don't know, you, you do things that make you feel in control. That's what athletes have. They do their little ritual things um, because they just want to feel like they have the ability to influence that they're going to have a good day on the track. Yeah. Religious people, they, they, you know, I don't know. They, their barn got knocked down after they saw a black cat. And so then they kill all the black cats in the town because they just want to feel like they're in control. And when it comes to Christianity, we're, we still have these impulses and the way that you want to have control as a Christian is that you want to give yourself full agency to do all of the steps. Mm. And so that's how you get to check boxism or legalism or wanting to believe that you're in the perfect church or that you've done the perfect steps because it puts all the control on you. And But that's not, that's not Christ because it's not. We're, we are helpless, but our fear is relieved because God has stepped in and done the things for us. But we're constantly trying to fight back because that's giving up the semblance of control. That's not going to get the baseball bat. And it, it feels safer to hold it. It feels safer to go through those motions, yeah. which is why we always want the list. Just give me the 10 things. Just get what, But what's the most important commandment? But who is my neighbor? All of that is us trying to just grab a baseball bat to hold on to. Yeah, and I think most of us, most most Christians in America, around the world for that matter, most Christians could, we could do a lot, do well to try to welcome some of that discomfort in because the the what we are promised is a relationship with God. And as far as I believe, when you know when you become a Christian, you have that 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 you have that relationship. And I I would I, I what I'm trying to do anyway, I don't want to speak for anybody else. I guess what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to live in that and try to trying to kind of soak that up a little bit. Instead of this feeling that I've constantly got to be trying harder to make God happy with me, um, to please him, because apparently salvation's not enough. You know, Christ isn't enough in that scenario, because I've got to fix it by um, making sure that Sunday morning goes smoothly, or making sure that I got the right version of the Bible, or fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can work on being comfortable with some discomfort or with some lack of control and let, let the salvation that you've been given through Christ be enough and quit trying to manufacture control over God. Maybe we need to st start thinking about the word faith it's not it's not belief it's not believing the correct things it is giving up control it is mm. giving up control and and the the thing you need faith for is that feeling that i i have let go of the training wheels and now i have and so there's that moment when you don't know what's going to happen yeah, that's that's what we need faith for. Yeah, <laughs> it's, Amen. it's because we're being asked to, to to move forward. I oh, it's so good. I j just real real quick. I um I ve very very uh, uh clearly remember a story from my childhood where I had climbed up a tree and got stuck. I couldn't climb down. Climb down. I, I must have been five or six. And my dad came out to the yard and I, I was out of his reach and I was refusing. So he, he was holding up his hands and he was saying, I'm right here. I'm ready to catch you. I promise I'm going to catch you. You just need to let go. Yeah. And I refused to let go. And he took that moment to teach me a little bit about what faith is. And that's it. That's the picture. Hmm. 
God, God is saying, I'm, I've got you already. Yeah. I'm here to catch you. You don't have to hold on to that anymore. And, and faith is believing that enough that you, you let go. Um, you don't realize he's, al- he's already holding you. He's yeah. already got you. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. That's a beautiful thought. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, when I'm talking, I, maybe I'm sensing this in you too, but with me, when, I, when I'm talking through this stuff, I'm constantly fighting through, for me, 45 years of do it the right way. Do it the right way. And I'm realizing that it's not, I don't, it's not, I don't know if it's about the right way. It's yeah. the right God. You know, I, I, I'm following Christ. And that's what it's about. And I need to do that. <laughs> yeah. And doing church is not following Christ. You know? Yeah, and the, when when you start to... It, it brings a completely different richness to church, a completely different... Oh, yeah. To the Bible. And like, I don't know. Seek ye first. I don't even know it in not King James because it's better in King James. Yeah. I'm not a King James guy, but th- every once in a while you got to for the poetry you got to go. <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Well, okay, I'm I got, I can't talk and think at the same time. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. Um and then all these things will be added to you. Is I've always thought of that about like what you're not supposed to run after. Like don't worry too much about these things. And I think it is about that. But I think another thing that I run after is all of the rules and how I'm going to do it right. And he's saying, no, 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 just, just do this. Just seek the kingdom first. And then all that stuff gets taken care of on its own. You don't, you don't find all the stuff and then find yourself in the kingdom. You go, you seek the kingdom and then all those things happen. This, the fruits of the spirit are, are not how to be a Christian. They're what happens when the spirit is in you. It's not, do these things to to get the spirit it's mm. the spirit does this in you you know it's all <sighs> it's all backwards from how i want to do it um and it's endless man it yeah, just and, and it keeps the, going the, the the there's a verse the verse that i never understood and never i mean never really grokked is my yoke is easy my burden is light <laughs> this is a hard yoke yeah. this yoke is hard i mean but if, I mean, thinking about following Christ like like we've been talking about tonight, that's freedom. And that that is a that is not a heavy yoke. You know? That that's because if if I'm burdened by the 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 pressing down of thousands of tiny little rules that I've got to follow and like be worried about if I'm doing it the right way all the time, um, that, that's, that's, that's oppressive. That's hard. That's heavy and hard. And that's not easy. But Jesus promised us, follow me and my, this, the, my way will be easy for you. And letting go of that, uh, the chains that bind you to rules for everything and focusing on following Jesus, that to me, that that's a lot more freedom than I have really ever experienced in my faith. I'm looking and freedom, forward to figuring that out. Yeah, freedom, freedom and exposure, like to my uh, rock climbing analogy, are very closely related. <laughs> yeah. So there's the freedom of the hills. That's actually the mountaineering Bible name. It, the freedom of the hills is that the better you are at climbing exposed, dangerous places, the more vistas you're going to see, right? The freedom is difficult. The freedom of of mountaineering is um, is that you work hard and that you're in shape and that you're prepared and that you plan. But the but those things give you the freedom to to go further and farther and explore. Um, and the taking taking the first few steps from legalism or whatever you want to call it, which is to a, a it's like the difference between believing that Christians are supposed to be joyful. And so you have to grimace a smile on yourself. (laughs) 
I, uh, there's nothing less joyful to me than having to be joyful. <laughs> Forcing um, it. Or, or, for, or having to be joyful to other people or encountering someone that's joyful when I'm not. I, yeah. None of that is joyful to me. But man, how joyful it is to encounter Christ and be freed in that way that it's real joy and it that's the kind of joy that can happen when I'm grumpy or when I'm, you know, when things aren't going good because, by the way, things, spoiler alert, <laughs> in life, things don't go good. No. <laughs> that's, uh, so, um, that, you know, it's, it's not, man, things don't go good and I've got to do all this stuff right or, or I'm, you know, going to get only this percent on my Christian grade. It's things don't go good and Christ has said he's going to with me, be with me. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing. And there's other people doing it with me too, that bad things are happening to them also, mm, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for making me think a lot tonight. This has been really good. Yeah. This as always so fun to talk. Uh, it's so fun for me. So I, I can't wait to see what we're going to talk about next time. <laughs> Me too. I'll see you later, man. See you later. You wanted me to win, but you only wanted love. Hey, thanks for listening to Following the Fire. If you'd like to see show notes for this episode, which includes links to everything we mentioned as well as all the scriptures, head on over to followingthefire.com and just click on this episode. There's also contact information on the website. Let us know what you think about the show and if you have any suggestions for future topics. Also, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts if you could. It really helps other folks find the show. And as always, thanks to the fabulous Daniel Wheat for the theme song and the music for the episode. You can find more of his stuff on Apple Music and Spotify. See you later. Even on my heart Can't compare with what you're worth